Hello there. Welcome to another subjective experience of the Hinted Neuron Podcast. On today's episode, you hear me talk with Dustin Miller, Paul Innovator. We talked about innovation, self-education, smart cities, smart homes. We talked about a bunch of things and there's a lot of juice in this episode and uh, it will be really nice if you listen to the end because there's so much things you could pick from. If you have any questions, comments or concerns, don't forget to reach out to me on Instagram and Twitter at Hinted Neuron. If you love this podcast, leave a review, five stars on Apple Podcasts, share it, subscribe, and, you know, tell your friends about it. And now, here's my conversation with Dustin Miller. I am here with Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Hello. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Sorry, I didn't know there was going to pass there. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so um i Dustin, i think a good place to start would be because you, I, I i i've been reading some of what you wrote and you talk a lot about self-education through mod- modular degree frameworks i know a lot about um self-education and i'm very big on self-education but what do you mean by modular degree frameworks so the modular degree is a self-endeavor that i made for myself in order to kind of build up Poly Innovator and also teach myself things. So I realized with my last blog and content stuff that I was doing that I wasn't good enough to what I wanted to do. So what I decided to do was become... Uh, to cut this part out. So essentially, I wanted to pursue a degree that wasn't, didn't exist yet. And so I wanted to create my own because I couldn't find one elsewhere. So what I did was I created a whole bunch of courses and videos and books and all that good stuff all into this list that I could pursue. And I realized that over time that it became more than what I was just thinking that it was. And I realized, okay, other people could use this. And so I wanted to create this modular education framework or platform, I guess you could say, that uses the modular degree system, these like tools where people can make their own education and try to pursue their own identifiable careers. So what you mean is that, you know, just this, you mean bite-sized kind of information that you just call it on the internet that could like form Something like a real degree. Is that what you mean? No, not bite-sized. I mean anything. So it could be bite-sized, but I'm talking more like MOOCs or courses or micro-credentials or audiobooks, things that take time. Like a lot of MOOCs take like 30 hours to complete. And so mm. it, it's a collection of everything. So it's, it's one of those things where it could be overwhelming. It could be almost even annoying to pursue. But I think that if you're curious and if you like self-education, you would enjoy it a lot more. Yeah, I think that's super cool though because I'm, 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 I'm you know, I, I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm really big into self education and I do a lot of mocks online, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, I think the first one I started with was edX. I, I don't know if you know that platform too. They're doing stuff on Udacity and all these other platforms. But, oh yeah. But, but, but now you mean your own platform is I could just go there and you know see what you've already collected collected and, you know, just run through it by myself. So I'm still building it. It's nothing that more than a concept at this particular point when it comes to the development aspect, but the platform ideally would be able to use edX or Coursera or FutureLearn or any other platform and just kind of collect courses for the person to take. It's more going to be self-directed. I want to be able to use AI or mentors down the line, but at first it's going to be you or I pursuing our own education. What I really like about it is the kind of social aspect. If you make a modular degree that I'm interested in and you make it public, then you could share with me what you're pursuing. And I could take out the things that I don't want to do, but you already found the courses that help you learn that skill. We might as well share and become more of a person for those skills. Yeah, yeah. I think I get this. It's really interesting. Like some kind of pay-to-pay learning. Yeah, it's super cool. But because um, now you, you mentioned it's a collection of anything and you, you do some kind of omni-channel um, um, content because you talked about having video content, audio content and books. So is it because it was it your interest in omni-cha- um, omni-channel um, content that, you know, just um, drew you to like collate any kind of content that has to do with audio, video, books? text or all those things? No, actually. It's an interesting connection that you made there, but they're actually pretty separate concepts for me. I 
am a collector by nature. Like I collected Pokemon cards when I was a kid and that's just something I enjoyed doing. Uh, so I always like collecting resources anyways. I literally was talking to someone right before this interview here and I spent the last 20 minutes talking to him, just sharing resources. There was one interview I had where we literally spent an hour and a half just sharing links and resources because I've collected so much. So personally, I'm just a collector. And when it comes to the modular degree, that came as an evolution of that, but it also came as a solution because I found that there was no degree official one that would actually teach me the stuff that I wanted to learn. I wanted to work in smart city development and there was no degree for that. And so being able to work in that field, and I'm still learning today, is something that I wanted to find a way to do. Omnichannel content came around where I was creating content for videos and blog posts and podcasts, or as I called my polycasts, is that these are separate pieces, but there was no reason why they couldn't be repurposed. Some people take an audio podcast, transcribe it, make it into a blog post. You can make a video, cut out the audio, make a podcast. And so by understanding how the content repurposing works, I'm able to be on multiple platforms each episode for my main series called the Omni Content, aptly named, I guess you could say. And so Omni Channel came about from my interest in being everywhere. Yeah, you, you really brought up something really interesting. It caught my interest. Um, smart city development, what's that? Smart cities are the future of what cities are going to be like. So when you think about street lamps, for example, right now they're on a timer. They're not very smart. But when, let's say you're at an intersection at 2 a.m. and you're trying to drive somewhere and it's red light for you, but there's literally no one for miles around, if that is the case, or just for a long distance at least, then the sensors on the smart lamp or smart street lights, so to speak, could sense that, okay, you're the only person here. Let's change the signal to where it's green. Or if there is sensitive sensors on the ground saying, okay, there's snow here. Let's send an electrical charge to the concrete and melt the snow. These are different technologies that are being developed that by themselves could be really awesome. When you put them all together, it could be revolutionary when it comes to data. For example, Singapore is a smart nation. They actually built a lot of the buildings in their city to control the wind flow of how the wind flows to their city in the most ideal, optimal way. These are things that smart cities can do. Uh, are this really connected to Internet of Things? Because I, yes. I, I, I know a lot about IoT and I, I, I read a little about it. I, mm-hmm. I did the foundations of what smart cities would be. Yes, in a way. There's also a matter of like philosophical and ideological aspects behind smart cities as well, because it is a different way of operating. Think about it with like automated cars. When Tesla is trying to make all their cars have AI to drive it, it's still being developed right now, but eventually, 20 years down the line, you'll get in a car and there's no driver. And there's going to need to be organizations or systems in place to organize where those cars go, how they interact with each other. And there's a, there's a matter of privacy, and a lot of people don't like that. Now, IoT, AI, machine learning, these are all foundations for smart cities. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up because I, you know, I'm a software engineer myself mm-hmm. and um, I work in AI field. I work... Um, around reinforcement learning. I don't know if you've done, if you know. Bit. Yeah. So I do a lot of reinforcement learning and, um, and um, multi, multi, multi-agent systems. And, and because you brought up Tesla, which is a really good example of multi-agent systems whereby these agents are in, in, in the wild collecting data. So my car could be collecting data that other cars would use. And, I think that's still a pretty interesting link with smart cities because I think this data would be used across all, you know, all nodes in maybe the particulars in this smart network. But I want to get your own perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to collecting data, it's one of those things where there's so much we haven't explored. So if if you want to get on a slight tangent here, we only know about 5% to 10% of the ocean's contents. We have no idea what's going on in our oceans. I actually found out the other day that Google Maps is very limited. When you look at the US or even like other countries in the Europe or Brazil and just Australia, more the places that you would think of, they have plenty of mappings for all those areas. But when you look at Africa, when you look at other areas of South America, when you look at Eastern Europe or China, is a prime example where they don't have any at all, it seems like um, these are very unmapped areas. When you have data collecting cars, well, then maybe you don't need a Google sponsored car. You could just use Tesla cars and have that stitch together maps of certain areas. Oh, just, hold on. Yeah. I activated my Google speaker by saying the name. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was really interesting. I mean. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, okay. When it comes to data privacy, then this is a m- small tangent here. That'd be a good idea is that there's these big companies, there's Facebook, there's Amazon, there's Apple, there's Microsoft, there's Google. I only trust so many of them. And I know that some people don't trust Google. I don't trust Apple. Some people don't trust Amazon. And what's good reason? These are big companies. We should be hesitant. We should be cautious. But Google is one of the companies that I trust the most out of the options that I have. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know if because I for companies I don't trust. I, I, I really like Google as a company. I, I just like their um, philosophy of whatever they are trying to do. But mm-hmm. I had because I don't know if you saw the Google memo. Yes, uh, not recently. Yeah. The issues issues around the Google memo. And uh, I, I think I, I began to become skeptical about some of the things they were doing around that time. But I think um, right now it would be really nice if we dive into some of the philosophy of these technologies because I think sure. about that a lot, even as a tech person. I like to think about um, technologies and, you know, the philosophy of how, just how it, it affects us as people and as humans. Mm-hmm. Do you think... Um, Technological process, um, te- technological progress is a net positive or net negative impact on human condition. Oh, by positive, by far. Oh, for sure. Sure, we have a lot of issues with technology, but because of technology, deaths around the world have d- dramatically decreased. Our, we saw with the COVID pandemic that we are not good at responding to bio aspects. So when there's a plague or something like that, we're going to have issues. But because of technology, we've been able to track where people are and see who they contacted with each other and understand how different networks are, which is, again, a security concern, privacy and whatnot. But by far, being able to track someone who had COVID and seeing who they talked to and save that person's life because they are now have it and you can catch it early on. That's a prime example of something that saved people's life. The AI and Tesla's uh, when it comes to the self-driving cars, has stopped to, from hitting people. Sure, there's a lot of stories about them hitting people. But there's a lot more stories about them not hitting people because they automatically stopped because they saw somebody. So technology is already going to help us in many ways. Yeah, and you know, even when we talk about technology and for some of the grounding, the main building blocks of some of these technologies we have is the internet. Mm-hmm. And we still see that some people don't have some people don't have um, access to the internet, even as a 2020, which is really bad at some kind of countries and and, and all that. Do, do you think the internet as of now should be a fundamental human right? That is an interesting question. And I guess my opinion would be something that is yes. I think we should have access to it. I don't know if it's necessarily something we should pay for or not. I, I mean, there's certain rights that we still have to pay for it sometimes too. Um I do agree that around the world, even in the US, like if you just leave the city that I live in just a hundred miles out or something like that, or even 10 miles out of the city, there's very little internet access. And I was talking to someone in Nigeria just a couple of weeks ago who had one megabyte per second download. Whereas my access, which is pretty optimal for where I live, is a hundred megabytes per, uh, per second download. And that's a significant <laughs> difference. And the worst I've ever had was three, six, or nine megabytes per second. That was about six years ago. And so I think nowadays it'd be a little bit more than that, but I can't go anything less than one. You said the worst you have was what? Uh, Three or six or nine megabytes per second. That was like six years ago. And and again, that's still triple or nine times what that person had in a different country. I think that six is minimal. If you have anything less than that, you're not going to be able to load very much. It takes forever to load. (laughs) Even for me, yeah. sometimes I'm loading a website with the speed that I have now. And I'm like, oh, this is taking forever. And I have a nice PC and internet and I'm trying to brag and something like that. But it's just one of those things where I have access to these things. So I do think that having access is right. I don't know if maybe having it for free is not. I don't know. Yeah, I, it, that was really interesting, though. I, 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 you, you said some really st- some stuff that just <laughs> <laughs> blew my mind. Just yeah. now. <laughs> because <laughs> the internet speed is, is crazy over there. But... I, I, you know, I've thought about um, science and tech and what we are doing now as society in general. Do you think for problems that we still have to solve and, you know, issues that will arise in, in the future, do you think there's a limit to what we can create or solve with science and technology? No, 
I mean, even Moore's Law, when you look at that, we're actually approaching the precipice of Moore's Law in ending. Like it's been so exponential that we're basically there. We're, we're literally reaching physics level of computer science when it comes to creating computer processing units. And yet we're able to expand differently into quantum computers. I had a quantum physicist on my show and I talked to her about this a little bit. Not, not as much as I hoped, but, uh, literally. These different types of computers, they might not replace our current ones, but they can be used in different ways. And the way that cloud and blockchain computer uh, computing is changing how we approach the Internet, there's always going to be more differences we can do, whether it's tech hardware or software. Yeah, <laughs> just, just a little story that's, that's mm-hmm. um small divergence because you, you brought up quantum computing. And today I was trying to explain quantum physics to my 11 year old brother <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know what's the best analog- analogy you use you use Schrodinger's cut mm-hmm. sure so I, I told him that um, because when we reached the, when we reached the part about the cat being alive or dead I now asked him how do you tell if the cat is alive you know what he told me he said if the, if the box moves then he will know that <laughs> the cat is alive I, I was so blown up like why did anybody, why, why did I not think of that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that definitely the, this box could move and I could really tell if the cat was alive or dead. Right. But, and you know, I, I, I think a lot too about quantum computing too. And I, it's something I've researched deeply into too. And I, I, I think I'm really interested, but I, I don't want to, to have too many interests that, because, and, but then, this is, this is, this is, this is somehow because now I'm talking to you who does um, all innovator stuff. And, and then I'm saying, I don't want to have too many, but I think we should just, okay, maybe just dive into your poly innovation concept and w- what you mean by it. Okay. Before we move on to that, just to kind of go off of what you said, wh- one of my friends literally made a tweet that says, I can't decide whether I'm hungry or full today. And my brain is like, your stomach is in a quantum state because you can't observe it. <laughs> It's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> and so when it comes to Poly Innovator, that is my personal brand, as I call it. And it's literally just the foundation for any career or more importantly, all the careers that I want to have in life. So something you mentioned that I found a little funny is that you have too many interests. And I think the opposite. It's one of those things where specialists and polymaths are two different beasts, but they're both needed in society. And when you look at history, we've had both throughout our history from as early as we can look at records. There's people who were multi-talented. There's people who specialized. And actually it's more in the neuroscience that we actually better at doing many different things, not multitasking, mind you, but doing many different things in life that stimulates the neuroplasticity in the brain and actually fostering better connections between different areas. So in technology in particular, we need more polymaths to connect nanotechnology or biotechnology and these de- distant fields that are different from each other, but are now converging. And we need people who can understand both. Yeah, I I, I think maybe I, I should not be, because most times why I try to, why I try to um, shield myself from saying I have too many interests because I, I think I fear being called a jack of all trade. And, okay. You know, well, let's touch on that real quick because I, I have something to say just right off about that. Being a jack of all trades is not a bad thing. We've had negative context over the past hundred years. And mind you, that's only been a hundred years that people actually gave people crap about being divergent interests. But the full saying of jack of all trades, master of none, but also sometimes better than a master of one. People don't always mm. hear the last part. Yeah, I, I think that was really interesting. And, and, and I am... Um, and and for those who will be listening, and it's, it's really an interesting point for them to draw, though, because society is just hell bent on pushing you to this one thing. Mm-hmm. Just do this one thing, focus on this thing, and be good at this one thing. Because even when from when I was young, I really just hated being one single thing. Like you were trying to constrain me. I was like, I I needed to learn so many things. I want to do so many things that has you know a lot of sciences have intersections: engineering, mm-hmm. chemistry economics and just so many things you you wish you could learn and they just push you into one thing. Do you think is our education system that, that is to be blamed for this? 
In part, yes. So I'm not sure how it was for where you are in the world, but in the U.S., the Industrial Revolution hit pretty hard in a good way. And we were able to make dramatic changes, although some choices they made were kind of dumb. We're a very car centric society, despite the fact trains would do a lot better. So that's a whole nother tangent right there. But in the Industrial Revolution, we started establishing how we approached a nine to five day work job or um, how we approach specializing people, basically to be cogs in the machine. And David Epstein, the author of Range, a really good book for someone like you, is talks about how specializations for ants. Insects specialize. Humans are multidisciplinary people by nature. Now, if you want to be a specialist, that's totally fine. I'm not just because I said specializations for ants. I quoted that person doesn't mean I don't think specialists are needed. We do need some still, too. But if someone is more naturally inclined towards many different areas, we shouldn't stifle their creativity or innovation. Their curiosity is going to lead to more innovation. Yeah. So let's let, let's talk about um, the concept of uh, because it's, it's really nice to talk about genius, the aspect of genius when mm-hmm. we we are we're talking about innovation. What, what do you think is genius? It's interesting that you mentioned that because the person I I interviewed on my show and I also went on his show, he hosts a show called Thinking Like a Genius and I had him Mm -hmm. on mine and I just released the episode last week at the time of this recording, which is funny. So it's right on my Mm -hmm. mind, actually. We talked about neuroscience and flow. And so when it comes to being a genius, I think it's someone who has a deep level of knowledge and creativity. There's multiple types of intelligences. You don't have to be logical or mathematic intelligent to be a genius you have to be someone who is just well versed in that knowledge or that area and so i don't want to interchange knowledge and intelligence because they're not the same thing but by building knowledge and stimulating your brain in some ways you can become more intelligent in that area we are not locked by nature into one iq level or eq level we do have a hard time stimulating that but it can be done yeah, I want you to help me paint the picture of the distinction between these two things, knowledge and intelligence. Intelligence is a more ethereal factor. It's one of those things that we are born with, but we also can change nature versus nurture, so to speak. And then and knowledge is something that's more broken down into skills and learning from books or MOOCs and the stuff you acquire. By nature, the more you acquire, the more intelligent you can become. That's why a lot of geniuses throughout history read books. Ty Lopez is a prolific reader. And it's one of those things where Leonardo da Vinci, who's my hero, literally spent countless hours studying and being curious about various different things. He wasn't in a point in society like his his notoriety was very great, but he actually was a bastard. He wasn't able to become uh, a high ranking member of society. So that means he wasn't able to learn Latin. He couldn't go to schools. So he had to teach himself. But he is someone of way high intelligence and many different intelligences, actually, that we regard as someone who's a genius. But he was very uneducated. Yeah, if if we look at society now and, you know, just humans in general, people and, you know, people want what is best for them. Right. And genius is good. Why, Why do you think everyone can be a genius in society? Because I've thought about it and, you know. Why, why is it that everyone can be a genius? I mean, I know that like, if you look at it technically, if you look at the brains and the capacity of what we can do with neuroplasticity and just growth and just some people are genius by nature. And if you cultivate that, they become a genius. But, and this is an area that I still need to dig into more into is genius. But I do not think that everyone can. Not that they're not incapable, not that they're incapable of it, but there's a certain level of self-education and grit and capacity that just some people just don't have. I know people in my family who just don't want to get off the couch and do stuff. I know people in other people's families who don't want to do the same. People all around the world can be lazy. And in order to become a genius, it's not just nature. It's also nurture. You have to nurture yourself and have family and people who've taken care of you to generate that. Yeah. I. But then again, you know, I, I, I think about socialization in terms of how people... Because I, I always try because I, I work hard a lot and mm-hmm. I see a lot of people who don't do as much. So I, I, I really, I use sometimes I try to rationalize why, because if we want what's good for ourselves, I mean, as rational agents, we want what's good for ourselves. And why is it that some people, because you mentioned some people just stay on the couch. Do you think is lack of motivation or frustration or, I, I, sometimes I try to picture their own worldview of why they don't strive as much as people who do so much work. 
Um, one way I like to explain it is spirals. And so when you go in a normal sense, we're kind of like an hourglass. How about that? Not spirals, but an hourglass. When we start out, we're at the bottom of the hourglass. And the less you do, the lazier you are, the worst situations that happen to you, the where you grew up in the world, all those different factors can make you spiral down the hourglass and fall down into the cycles. And then you're in the, a big pit and you can't really crawl yourself out. So you need help. So the people who have PTSD, who have been in war, they might be down those spirals that can't get out by themselves. There's other people who are just lazy and don't want to pull, pull themselves out. But eventually something will call to action them into place and they'll grow into the upper half. When you get to the upper half of the hourglass and it spirals upward, it takes time. You have to build upon your practices and habits and systems and knowledge and self-education and grit, all these different factors involved and understand each of them and try to pursue them. And the more you compound, that's why I think polymath is very important because compounding is a very inherent process behind being a polymath. But when you compound more, you become going up the spiral. And more closer to genius, more closer to success and happiness. Yeah, you 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 bring up happiness, which is really interesting because um, there's this there's been this constant debate about intelligent people and um, whether they are they are less happy. But do you think uh, highly intelligent people are prone to be less happier than average intelligence people? I mean, ignorance is bliss, isn't it? And so, yeah, I guess by nature, more intelligent people are going to be sadder. Like you could think of Robin Williams, a famous comedian, someone who's an actor and prolific polymath, I would even say. And he did so many different things. People always saw him with a smile on. And yet he killed himself because he was not happy because he wasn't able to share it with the world. When you're surrounded by people who are not as intelligent as you, it's going to bring you down in a way. When you surround yourself with people who are more intelligent than you, Bill Gates, for example, small little tangents, Bill Gates literally is a genius in many different ways. He's he's a polymath in the modern day, and he surrounds himself by experts, people who are smarter than him because they bring him up. He's able to go toe to toe with these experts and feels that he just barely touched on. He self-educated himself, which most people would think that that's not very powerful, but it is. He's able to go toe to toe with these people because he pursued those educations very deliberately and powerfully. And so it's one of those things where he surrounded himself by people who are smarter than him. So he's probably significantly happier. That's just a deception, but it's still, there's a book. I don't remember exactly what it's called. Something about genius by Walter Isaacson, who literally he talked about in one of the podcasts he was on how, and also in the audiobook as well. Geniuses who are alone are often unsuccessful. It is the geniuses who can actually gather people around them and do stuff with them that are actually successful. Nikola Tesla had a benefactor, but he was very isolated. He didn't actually communicate with people very well. They might even thought he had some mental issues in a way, but he was a significant genius and made significant progress when it comes to electricity. But he was alone. Thomas Edison, his competitor, is much more renowned and successful in the public's eyes, despite the fact he was a bad person, but he was able to market himself. He was able to get interns around him and bring people in. You, you you bring up a really, really interesting, very, very, very interesting topic there because I, you know, I've thought about this a lot and maybe I have experienced it. This sort of depression just because you don't have people who, who people around you to stimulate your brain and just to make you active in any way. And we, I mean, there's so much you could do alone though. There's so much you could do alone. And, and I think at that point in my life, I just hit this limit where I, I needed, I needed a lot of stimulation, a lot of people to talk to. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of stuff on my own. I read, I do research and, oh, I, I, I broke down that same time just because I, I, I was lacking stimulation from, you know, just high level conversations whereby you, you know, those kind of conversations where you leave, you have so much energy to go yeah. back and do some kind of other thinking. But if, what, what do you think as, you know, as society we could do? Do you think technology could solve that issue? Like, maybe building platforms that connect people in this kind of very connected way. I, 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 I don't know. Dude. I think that with the internet, more people like us are connecting with each other. I mean, look at, for example, what we're doing here, we are literally trying to establish a, a common ground between you and I, we know each mm-hmm. other through matchmaker, but that's it. And yet we were able to go dive right into this conversation and have a fascinating conversation with each other. So I think that, you and I both are trying to pursue this and by having interviews, it's very helpful because I personally have 
felt very different after having these interviews that I've had on my show. And so I think that for you too, is having people who are smarter than you in some ways, it's maybe dumber than you in some ways to teach them too. Sharing knowledge is very crucial. Yeah. You, 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 you brought up um, a topic on self-development here at that time. And I, I, what I saw in your blog when I was doing some research was you, you talk about this um, self-development through the four pillars of um, philosophy. Mm. What, what do you mean by that? So I created the four pillars based off of my learning of philosophy throughout different cultures throughout the world. And so self-development through the four pillars means taken after the four major aspects of life. So going back to that hourglass analogy, I mentioned grids and self-education and stuff like that. But in reality, I think that going up and down that hourglass revolves around these four pillars, the mind, the body, the spirit, and emotions. Now, understanding those aspects of your life can be very hard. That comes down to emotional intelligence, not just in yourself, but in others as well. Your happiness, like we talked about moments ago, revolved around kind of having that social connection. We talked about education earlier too with the modular platform and how peer-to-peer -peer learning is very important. Having that sharing of knowledge that makes you happy. You try to explain uh, things, quantum physics to your, your family member who's younger than you because you wanted to share that knowledge with somebody. You wanted to have that connection. And so I think that that happens to impact our emotions, our mental well-being, our emotions actually directly impact the temperature of our body and physically make changes to our body. The spirituality aspect is kind of having a connection with your subconscious and the people around you, not necessarily religious, but in, in a more scientific way, the bridge between the conscious mind and subconscious mind. So that's what I mean. Uh, do, do you think, though, that um, as, as people in general, do you think um, understanding philosophy could lead, lead to progress in society if maybe more people had knowledge of philosophy it could lead to meaningful progress? Oh, by far, yes. Um, I believe it was Socrates or Plato. I can't remember which one who talked about the philosopher's king, which is a king of back in that time. That's what they acknowledged. Uh, that's what they talked about were for leaders, but the leader who is driven by philosophy, not by internal emotions and primitive mindsets are the ones who are able to make significant change in the world. So if we can have a leader, let alone society, that's based around philosophy and doesn't matter which philosophy, just a matter in general of expanding the mind, I think is very important. Yeah. I, I think that was, that was a really clear perspective. I, I think I love that perspective. A lot. Well, let I, me add on yeah. a little bit, please, if you don't mind. My yeah. dream in life is to be a CEO of an international company driven to innovate technology and ideology, which is just another word for philosophy, finding the balance between those two. So I think that's something that you might resonate with. Yeah, sure. I, that, that's super interesting, though. I'm, and I, for because most of what you are doing too is you know trying to better human life, and I think about that a lot too. And you know, alleviating, mm -hmm. just kind of trying to remove suffering from the human condition. And I, I think that's still the same thing you are basically trying to do with smart smart cities. You know, trying to remove as much suffering and and um, hardship from human lives. But I, then again, I think about human nature too, because we, we could say we want to lessen suffering. But do you think um, human nature can be changed? Or should it be changed, in fact? I mean, whether we should or shouldn't, I don't think it's the real question to ask. It's, it has it changed. And if you look at history, I would say it has. We're still evolving physically. I'm sure that we're going to evolve emotionally and mentally and spiritually as well. If you look at certain places around the world where they're a little bit more isolated, like Tibet, where they're more spiritually inclined. And so I think that when it comes to certain aspects of humanity, whether it's a, one of the four pillars or something else, I do think that we are changing. And if we can accelerate that change, then that'd be really great. Yeah. I, I want us to you know, go, go back to smart cities you talk about because that's something that really um, catches my attention too. So for smart cities and, you know, just um, apart from, you know, the outside view, what, what do you think about smart homes and, and things that could be in our homes in the future that would, you know, just make our lives easier? I mean, they're all part of the same system. So on a citywide scale, having smart homes is going to be helpful. For example, digital electricity. 3DFS, I think, is a really good platform that's building out these digital electricity power for the households. So for example, 
In the U.S., we have analog electricity, which means we have all these cables dragging around. The sc- if you look at these streets, you'll see cables dragging around along the streets. It's very primitive, I would say. We built it probably 60, 70 years ago, and we're still using that same system. And the way it works is like sending a whole bunch of electricity through the network in one direction. Sometimes it can switch directions, but most of the time in one direction, very powerfully. And by distance, there's these little nodes that break down electricity more and more until it gets to your house. And then once the electricity gets to your and then once the electricity gets to your house, it um, breaks it down even farther into the outlets. But throughout that entire process, we are wasting electricity through heat. The heat just escapes from the cables. And so we're sending in maybe 10,000, I don't know if it be amps, I don't know the particular terminology for it, but let's say 10,000 amps. And throughout the gets to your house, only about 6,000 is actually getting to the house when it comes to breaking that down. If you were to look at it in that analogy, it's like sending a power, uh, f- a fire truck hose of water into a little teapot. It just doesn't make any sense. Sure, the water is going to get in there, but it's really wasted. So if you get down to the digital electric grid, and trust me, there's a point to what I'm saying, this little tangent here. When you get to the digital electric grid on a city scale and home scale, it makes a big difference on efficiency, how much electricity we're using, and more importantly, the whole economy of electricity. Right now, we're paying for people to provide us electricity. But if we have solar panels on the top of our roof and maybe a wind generator, I don't know if we'll have that, but if we have a wind generator in our household somehow, some way, well, then we can generate our own electricity in our own house, which is a node. Well, eventually, you're going to probably generate more electricity than you're actually using. And then you can send it, sell it back to the grid. And that digital system is the key to doing that. You can't do that in the traditional system that we're using now. And so being able to send back electricity into the system and actually generate more is a key thing about the households. I don't know if that directly answered answered your question, but it's key to smart homes and smart cities. Yeah, that's that really interesting. I, I, you, you brought up really key things that, um, that I think that are really, really good and important because most of the times when I'm thinking about um, smart homes and maybe... For me, I, I think about just the fun, playful part where... Um, Google if system, I, for example. <laughs> my fridge, if I'm running low on, on fridge juice, I, my fridge could just help me order something. Mm-hmm. So um, help me restock or something from... It's connected to maybe the to maybe to maybe Amazon or something that could help me reorder um, fridge juice. But I, I think you really brought up some very useful things that, that are interesting there because for, for people like me who have not thought too deeply, into this, well, if we, if if we look at society now and and you know with the way things are going, you 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 seem like a really good tech person too. And Thank you. I've thought about this too. And for do you think if our government were run by algorithms and AI and statistics, maybe the world would be a better place at all? I'm not sure if you're referring to a technocracy or not, but I actually thought about this the today. Like, why aren't we just running by AI? And it's one of those things where we do need people involved. AI can only get to a certain point in the next coming decades. And even if it gets dramatically improved through exponential progress, I do think <clears throat> there's a certain point where AI can to make the decisions that we need. There's a certain point where a, um, AI still needs humans to help make decisions that are the most benefit to society. That means you have the opinion that maybe the, you know, because if we remove humans, if we, I mean, if humans are still in the loop for any kind of thing we do concerning technology, that means the singularity might not occur. I'm saying more in the next coming decades, because it's one of those things, the singularity may occur, but I don't think it's going to happen in the next century. Honestly. Yeah. In in, in terms of um, the human condition, or what, what do you think we could be doing? Because I, you might have thought about this too. You know, just around society for, okay, maybe people in people, people uniquely or society at large. What, what do you think they could be doing for themselves or in society mm. to make things better? That's a good question. So to give a little bit more context, before Poly Innovator, I created a brand called the United Living Construct, which I meant to be a hub of innovation for people like you and I all around the world to come together to innovate and make a change. And that whole thought process came from world unity through self-development. And so that whole idea of starting from the person, developing, educating themselves. And then as a society, if everyone's doing that, the whole society elevates because each individual person 
has elevated themselves. So having a smart city is great, but if the people in it aren't actually making use of it in the most accurate or important manners, it doesn't matter. And so I evolved from that into Poly Innovator because I wanted to be able to be more teaching and be more personal. And so I wanted to create this modular education, which is actually the first part of my personal Poly Innovation system. So it's a three-part process, self-education, self-improvement, and self-development all of which helps with that hourglass analogy that I mentioned earlier. Self-education as the foundation through the modular degree or just any sort of autodidactic endeavor, really. And then the second part of that being habits and systems. What are you doing on a daily basis that contributes to your life? Are you working out? Are you taking care of your body? Are you making sure that you're actually getting a job? Are you taking care of your habits? Are you being lazy and not doing as much? Or are you being very proactive and getting things done? That comes down to your habits and systems. And then beyond that, the more exponential factor, having the four pillars. If you understand your four pillars of your life, you're going to be able to make a bigger change. Yeah, you you bring up something really interesting there because you talk about self-development and self-learning a lot. What do you think is the future of schools? And maybe, if, maybe, maybe let me just say the next maybe 30 years, 40, 50 years. How do you think schools would have evolved? Or do you think they'll ever catch up at all or they'll be eradicated some of the stuff? For one, it's going to change dramatically. Universities are, I don't want to say archaic, but they're still kind of following the same traditional learning that we have for a long time. And many people aren't learning in that way. So when it comes to education, you mentioned edX, the CEO or ex-CEO, I guess, uh, Anant Agarwal, who talks about modular education. I share my same opinion with him where educations can become more stackable, more Lego-like, where different pieces, and b- bits and pieces are going to come together. You mentioned microbytes earlier. It's one of those things where if, even if it's as big as a course or as small as a module in that course, coming together into your own individualized curriculum. That's the whole point behind a modular degree for me as well. Yeah. That was really interesting. And and I still want us to touch on, there's this thing you talked about when, when we brought about the issue of philosophy. Okay. You talked about um, spirituality. Do you think um, spirituality is quite important? Uh, do, do you think it's important for a happy life or is maybe it's important for for people as a whole? Spirituality is a tense concept because some people think of it as religion and sure you can be more spiritual through the religion but i often find that religious people don't have a very strong spirituality in general because they often get blindsided by their faith and i'm not saying anything about faith i'm just saying from what i've seen from multiple different cultures is that many people get caught up in the philosophy of their faith and the belief systems that they neglect themselves in a way And so I believe that spirituality is a connection between the conscious mind and subconscious mind. Building up the connection, building up the neural pathways and connections in your brain. Whether that means studying or pursuing some kind of art or ikigai, if you will, maybe. I think spirituality is a big part of it, which is why I put it in the four pillars. But I don't think it's as basic as we're putting it in this context. Yeah. Now, now you brought up two things that really caught my tra- my attention. Okay. You you brought up um, consciousness, and I, I still I I think we would dive into that <laughs> if you have time. But I, I want you to talk on what you mean by ikigai, first of all. So ikigai is a Japanese concept for a reason for being. I'm actually going to make a mini series on this with my content down the line. And the reason for being is a combination or a Venn diagram of these four areas. What are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? What you can make money off of and what the world needs. And you could, if you could find the culmination of all four that's particular to you, everybody's is different, then that is your ikigai. And so being able to find that is one of the reasons why a lot of Japanese people live really long because they live happy lives. It's one of the key keys to happiness, I would even say. And so in uh, Okinawa, I believe is where a lot of people live up to like 90 or 100 years old. They're able to do this because many of them still work up until their 80s and 90s. They're still working even though they're old. And it's because they're very fit and happy and able to do so. They're fit and able, I guess you could say, because they have found their ikigai. Yeah. Now, now you know, you, you mentioned is is an old Japanese concept. Does that have to do with some kind of spirituality too? I mean... I would say so, considering if you find your happiness, that's going to lead to spirituality. Spirituality is just a process of human desire to understand things. And 
I think that if you understand yourself more, it becomes easier to understand the world around you, even if you want to or not. Yeah, please. Can you can you spell it just so that people who want to Google it, um, listening, you just yeah. Google the stuff? Well, there's a good book on it too. I-K-I-G-A-I. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So I, I want us to talk about, because you brought up really, really interesting things about consciousness too. And I think about this topic a lot because as someone into artificial intelligence, I try to think about if machines will be conscious one day. And I, I think about my own consciousness too, you mm-hmm. know. I meditate a lot, so I, I'm very aware of, I, I try to take note of the human consciousness and, you know, everything around that aspect. Do you, maybe you, you would have your own definition for it, first of all, but what do you think is human consciousness? It's probably the manifestation of thought and essentially the, I guess you could say the electricity impulses of the brain. I'm not sure exactly how it's built up. Most people aren't actually at this point. Even neuroscientists, they're still testing electrical impulses into the brain and seeing how the body moves in rats, for example, or even dead uh, people. And so understanding how consciousness is or operates is something beyond a lot of us at this point can understand. And I think that's kind of disheartening for people who want to learn like yourself. But there's another aspect of just digging deep and understanding yourself. Consciousness is understanding for the most part. And if you don't understand yourself, if you don't meditate like you're doing, then you're not going to understand what you're doing. And I think that impacts the other pillars as well. Because if you don't understand who you are and who you can be, then you're not going to know what you need to do for your body or your mind or how your emotions are. Because if you're unsatisfied with your life because you don't know where you're going, then your emotions are going to be wrecked. You're not going to take care of your body. You're not going to take care of your mind. Yeah, you, you still brought up a really interesting point. Now, what, what do you think, um, because as someone, because um, a lot of people live day-to-day lives feeling just so sad, how do you think we as people could build up happy lives? What do you think we could be doing at, you know, maybe a very micro, macro scale to lead happy lives in society? I mean, I created a personal poly innovation system for this reason. <laughs> I wanted to improve people's lives and give them opportunity to pursue success and greatness. And so the, the personal poly innovation system or PPS, as I say, is a foundation, it's consistency and it's exponentiality. Once you get those three aspects behind it, then that's going to make your life dramatically different. Even if you use some other kind of system but yes, besides mine, this will still help you get you towards that. Yeah. Even even apart from happiness, because I I try to I try to think about you know satisfaction and no, not satisfaction, not this self guilt that a lot of us face. And um, okay, okay, let me just tell you now, right now, as we're having this conversation, um, you know, I'm trying to because sometimes when I say some things, I'm like, why did I even say that? Um, because I'm 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 judging myself, trying to judge myself about about whether I'm doing better, whether I'm doing better, and just the self guilt normally. In mm-hmm. what I'm doing, even what's happening right now in this conversation, I'm just trying to ask myself if I'm even doing well at all in this interview. But how, so. how do you do? <laughs> how do you deal with much of this self guilt as and and um, as, as as a creative or someone who wants to create in the world? Um, I told my roommate this the other night, and he laughed at me. But and Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, a famous entrepreneur, talks about it a lot. Yeah. Don't care about what other people think. At this point, you are living the life that you want to live, or at least trying to. And if someone's judging you, well, that's prerogative. That's their prerogative. If they, if they leave a hateful comment or say something mean to you, or even say something nice to you, you don't have to internalize it. I gave you a compliment because I thought that you are doing well, and I wanted to convey that. And you seem to, you see, I, I thought you were doing well. I didn't even think about it, but you seem to be now telling me that you were kind of nervous and overthinking things. I was like, well, if I give him a compliment that's genuine, he's going to feel better about it and that he's going to do better the rest of the interview. And that's great. The other day I was interviewing someone and I could feel that he was kind of getting nervous. And so I paused it and say like, hey, it's okay. Like, I can cut things out. It's not a big deal. I also think that in this case where I'm sitting here, the only thing I'm thinking about is the interview. I'm in the, I'm active listening. I'm in the zone. I'm trying to focus on you. So I, I will say that I am thinking a little bit about food because so I haven't ate today. But beyond that, <laughs> I'm, I'm content in this motion. And if I say something stupid, then I can either ask you to cut it out. And if you don't want to cut it out, then what's the worst that's going to happen? Someone's going to call, cancel me 10 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> what was the moral dilemmas um, maybe your country is facing right now? <laughs> um, 
I will say I have to be careful about this concept because there's a lot of patriotism or even fascism, I guess you could even say in this country that will go after me if I say anything against what's going on, which is ironic considering freedom of speech. So I would say that there's a lack of leadership in multiple areas on multiple sides. This country is meant to be more free and not two parties. We're not meant to be bipartisan, as they say, which like Republicans and Democrats That's not how we we're meant to be. Even the founding fathers said against that. Um, but I would say that both sides of the table have been lacking in leadership. Yeah. And, and I, I think that was interesting too, because even for my own country now, mm-hmm. there's serious nationwide protests happening around police brutality and, and, uh, and bad governance. You know, and it's funny though, because um, I think you are in the United States and, mm-hmm. you know, f- for your own country, if you think about police brutality, it could be racially motivated, but you know, we don't have that kind of different kind of diverse mm-hmm. um, race in my own country. And you start to think about why there's so much police brutality against your own race. You just get me sick. And that's why I think about wickedness and human condition and how we could try to improve things. And, you know. It's a lack well, of self-control. I, what do you say? A lack of self-control, I would say too. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 you know, Technological speaking, I mean, how do you think at all we, if we want to even solve these problems at all? Because it's, it's a human problem. And do you think we could solve human problems with a fundamental human flaw with technology? Yeah, I mean, places like the US and other big countries in the world have tried to help various places in Africa through technology and it doesn't work. It has to come from within, usually, the intrinsic motivation. Sure, external help is helpful. Like I mentioned earlier in the hourglass analogy that someone at the bottom of the hourglass is going to need help. But if, if, it, if someone's any higher than that, sometimes help is actually a negative aspect. You have to have an intrinsic motivation to change. And when you have that, you need to find a way, what can you do to make a change? Speaking of which is the hashtag I use a lot is make a change. And so I think that in order to solve some of the problems that you're facing, it might need access to internet. You might need more electricity distribution, obviously clean water to drink, having the sustainability of your needs met. And once you get those foundations, then you can build on top of that. And technology can solve with that. Yeah, that was really interesting though. But I, I know you must, have, you must have thought about some of what affects us as humans. I, I know you... you you philosophize a lot about things. But what do you think is the meaning of life? Just for the kicks and giggles, 42 is a good answer for that question. But if you don't get the reference, it's from a movie. The meaning of life, I think, is to just try to survive. Like If you look at astrophysics and sci-fi and the bigger world beyond Earth, the whole point is just to keep living and discovering things. And right now we're approaching a precipice where we're either going to die out or we're going to expand exponentially. And I think that in order to get to that positive outcome, we have to make a change. We have to change things. We have to obviously use technology to its fullest, but also change our mindset. And police brutality is one of those things where it was a lack of self-control a lot of the time where people just want to engage their emotions and be, and this goes for every country in the world, primitive in their emotions, whereas emotions are part of our being, but we don't have to necessarily act on them. That's where spirituality comes in is understanding yourself. Why am I feeling this emotion? What can I do about it? Well, you don't ask those questions unless you know yourself more. So you need spirituality to understand your emotions. You need emotions to understand your physical aspect and various circles can go on from that. Yeah, I I think I I like your perspective on that topic. Thank you. Well, we we are getting close to the end of the interview now, but if if you just want to say anything, because I, I want to put you on the spotlight for one minute, you talk about anything you want to say to my audience, where they can reach you and what everything you're on about. So just go on. So I created Poly Innovator to be the foundation for all the stuff I want to do in life. And I hope to inspire people like that. I niche myself around polymathy, which is the concept of being someone with multiple disciplines. And I want to exemplify those people. So if you are one of those people, reach out to me. I could have you on my show and I, to dig into each area of your life. And that's called the Polymath Polycast. And then my main series is called the Omni Content, which is a specialized format where I create a blog post, I make a slideshow, I record over that slideshow to make a video, then I have to cut the audio out to make a podcast. And so then you get 
any platform you want. And so if you are more of a reader, if you're more of a listener, more of a video watcher, kinesthetic learner, you're going to find a way to engage with my content. Other than that, you can find me at polyinnovator.space and all the links to all my profiles are on that site. Yeah. Justin, do you think there's anything we were meant to talk about that I didn't bring up in the interview? I mean, we talked a little bit more about technology than I thought we'd do, like more neuroscience. I think we, we, <laughs> talk, we talked more technology and philosophy, but we neglected some of the science, I think. Yeah, and I'm pretty big on neuroscience. Yeah. Too, and I, 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 I kind of regret why I didn't bring that up too much. You're fine. I well, did that too one day. Time. Yeah, maybe next time you can have <laughs> me back on. I had a quantum yeah. physicist on my show. And we talked a little bit about quantum physics. It was more about, or like quantum computing specifically, but it was more about her brand and talking about her. And so I was like, that was a fantastic interview. But I was like, wait a minute. We ended the interview, talked for hours. I was like, wait a minute. We didn't even talk about quantum mechanics. (laughs) And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to have you back on because fantastic interview. Like I enjoyed it thoroughly, just like this one too. Like we didn't talk about it. You'll have me back on. We'll talk it again. Yeah, sure, man. Hopefully looking forward. Thank you for listening to the end. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe, share. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, please contact me on Instagram or Twitter at Hinted Neuron. That's it for me this week. And until then, stay curious.